Hello, I'm Jonathan Stark and welcome to Inside the Brackets. Today we're talking about HTML5 in the enterprise and the special challenges facing IT managers and developers who need to build apps in a business environment. Joining us today are Ganesh Rao, Engineering Manager Developer Product Division Intel, Bill Giard, Principal Engineer Intel IT, Maureen LaRue, Head of Global Mobile User Experience for Thomson Reuters, and Alex Williams, Enterprise Writer from TechCrunch. And with that, let's get started. Alex, I'd like to start with you. What are some of the key trends that you see in the enterprise when they're developing their own apps or maybe exposing APIs uh, in the back end? I think it's trying to make it work for the people who are using the apps. And part of the complexity right now comes with the actual workflows. How do you define those workflows? How do you enable those for, for people in the, in the workplace? There's been a struggle with, I think, some of like the fundamental issues such as security. But I think there's a next step, and that's the actual development of workflows. Mm -hmm. So people can create apps for their, their for just for very small tasks. Because these apps, they want them to do very specific things. And so that means a lot of apps. And so you need those app marketplaces, and you need those APIs, and you need those security. Mm -hmm. So when you say marketplaces, you mean like an internal app store? Yes. Cool. Bill, are you using anything like that? Does that all sort of resonate with your experience? Or? Certainly security is, is a big, big deal in the enterprise. I, I think when you're developing solutions to work you know, across multiple environments, um, you know, getting them securely working and functioning is a huge consideration for us. You certainly have to conquer the password problem, you know. You know, credentials for the device, credentials for the application, access to the data, and yep. so balancing security and usability for your users and their expectations are increasing, right? They're asking us to deliver solutions that are much, much more usable than what we traditionally have got away with before. <laughs> we are starting to see the abstraction of passwords behind management platforms. And that seems to be slowly taking, you know, slowly starting to become a reality, but it's going to take some time. Google actually said, their, their chief security person at Google said at our conference this week that at Google, passwords are dead. Mm -hmm. And I think when a company like Google says that, mm -hmm. you know, it means something for the rest of the market. Yeah. We have a lot to learn on that on that part. We have uh, passwords, we have RSA tokens, we have PIN numbers, all sorts of ways to. It, it takes it takes a hacker to get into our <laughs> our apps, and it's it, it's a it's a problem that we we really have to tackle that. Um, but the more the user wants something usable and accessible, the more IT their own IT wants security because we're presenting their own confidential content mm -hmm. onto our applications. Mm -hmm. But it's an issue also, I think, you know, not just with the users, but with the developers too. Mm -hmm. You know, the developers, for instance, are used to, you know, spinning up instances on Amazon Web Services mm -hmm. and they get issue, you know, they create a key pair and they just, you know, you know they don't really pay much attention to to that private login they, that they have, and, and then they're accessible to, you know, to attack very easily. Speaking of developers, I have a question for Ganesh. So you're responsible for creating tools for developers, and I'm wondering what some of the things Intel are doing to support app and API development in the enterprise. We develop tools on the client side to be able to create HTML5 and consume services that you create on the server side. Intel um, has invested um, in software services that uh, create APIs, make it easy to for easy for developers to access these APIs and then in a uh, potentially secure way. And on the client side, again, what we're focusing on is making sure that we not only handle specifications, but we uh, are getting user stories to see how we can include guidelines as part of development. So mm -hmm. some of the security items that came about here are having to do with how developers create software. We want tools that provide um, security from the time the code starts getting developed and not necessarily something that you uh, put in after everything is put together. Yeah, secure so, right from the start. Yes. The landscape's changed. You know, it used to be that we would run an application in our own IT data center sure. and that we could have control over the, mach the machine that it ran on, the servers that it run on. And so, you know, making sure the application is, you know, secure from the time you launch it and post production and maintains, you know, security feature sets after you've already developed or released becomes extremely important when you part, start deploying your solutions across multiple platforms and into the cloud and taking advantage of a lot of the things that are happening, you know, elsewhere in the industry. I'm wondering if you think that enterprise developers have different unique needs compared to 
um, to more consumer facing developers? I think there's two things that, that I see as being you know, key differences. One is the social coding collaboration ne needed across teams, right? You would, you would design solutions and take advantage of, of reusable libraries and everybody would try to take advantage of the single thing. But there's so much innovation happening in the HTML5, the, the cross-platform, the JavaScript libraries that people are, are hungry for understanding what's the latest and greatest way to do things. And so they're working better across teams at least internally. Mm -hmm. And the other element I think is there's more um, data and system integration that I've seen in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So you have to consider how am I going to integrate content and solutions mm -hmm. from other teams. Maureen, is, uh, do you have similar challenges? We, we do have, you know, our, our, our challenge definitely is based on the silos of the company and um, not having any one platform, uh, any specific efficiencies, allowing um, that social sharing of code uh, until about two years ago, that didn't really exist. At that, at that point, the company realized that something needed to happen in terms of um, creating some consistencies and guidelines and um, better resources and, and shared resources to, uh, across, across those silos to um, get our apps faster to market, more, uh, cheaper, mm -hmm. and even uh, distribute uh, resources in terms of talent uh, ac across the company and uh, educate. So the, the company decided to put together a small team, which I, I joined uh, about two years ago, uh, as a center of excellence um, for developers and for designers to help them bring their content to a mobile platform uh, in a more efficient way. And as we go forward, we're looking at ways that we can develop um, faster, and we're looking at um, cross-platform development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I assume it's safe to say that um that developing natively across multiple platforms would be an expensive proposition? It is. We're not developing cross-platform um, on all of our products. And at, the, at this day, we have a lot of um, iOS apps. It just happens to be uh, the way, the, the direction that um, a lot of developers within our product teams have chosen to go mm -hmm. based on what their customers are, um, uh, the devices their customers are using. Mm -hmm. And um, we have um, a lot of apps that should really be out there or, or have expired or not, are not being maintained. So at this time, what we're looking at doing is having fewer apps cross-platform. Mm, interesting. I, I, I agree with that statement. In fact, one of the things that I've heard um, talking to developers is fewer apps and crisper user stories. So these mm -hmm. apps do not necessarily do everything that it takes over from, but instead do the most important things well, mm -hmm. but do it yeah, kind of. Yeah. Our m multi platform um, journey started with multiple desktops to some extent in certain business lines. And then mobile was, was clearly starting with um, you know, iOS based mm -hmm. applications. Certainly a, a large uh, user increase in, in the number of, of Android devices coming into the environment and what we have across multiple operating systems. And so, you know, approaching that more holistically without having to redo it and report, a um, huge issue. So HTML5 has been a big win for you there, I think, right? Yeah, we've started as native applications. And while we don't, we have, you know, taken a different approach. We don't prescribe one specific way of doing development for our developers. We have a, a thousand developers in our organization that are actively writing code and, and we want them to, to you know, take advantage of what's happening. And what we've seen over the last nine months, 12 months is a significant shift, right? Um, from native application development to you know, browser-based HTML5 development. HTML5 uh, is where the majority of our internal development is, is putting them, their focus on, um, probably to the tune of four or five X browser-based HTML5 solutions for the solutions we're living in versus the native um, solutions that, that still happen. Just to give people a feel for the scope of it, what, what's the sort of mandate, the scope of platforms that you are forced to support? Within Intel IT, we have 1,400 applications or so that we, we own and manage. There's another um, broader set across Intel, 3,000 or so, um, that we either procure or develop or bring in-house. Our target is to get 80% of the 1,400 applications are working across multiple platforms um, it, within three years, right? So we want to extend, you know, Windows, um, uh, OS X, Android, iOS, right? Um, 
Linux, we want to get all of those in you know, our solution such that we remove the OS and browser dependencies. We, we want to support multiple OSs and browsers such that when a user brings in their device, they can be immediately productive. Over 42,000 you know, non-traditional devices, consumer, you know, bring your own devices that have come into the environment and that number is growing um, dramatically month on month. Wow, that's huge, huge growth. So it strikes me that I think uh, Marine and Bill in particular are talking about two different things when they use the word app. I think I'd like to tease that out a little bit. Yeah, we describe an app um, around, you know, anything that delivers, you know, a business transaction, serves a business function. Mm -hmm. um, so, so our primary focus is certainly business applications, you know, your ERP, your CRMs, your supply chain solutions, your design solutions. Um, but it extends beyond that. There are helper apps, there are HR apps that help you find a conference room, right, that do more than procure material or you know, work on the factory floor. So it's a pretty broad brush for apps that mm -hmm. we have. When we talk about apps, we talk about cons customer facing apps. I think of apps being mobile apps more than desktop apps. Of course, mm -hmm. we do have all of our products are on desktop um, as apps as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we also differentiate mobile apps from mobile websites or mm -hmm. um, um, mobile optimized websites. We are certainly um, taking a, a pretty direct approach that we want our apps to work across desktop and mobile. So, you know, we're moving past the, you have a separate mobile app and then a desktop app, mm -hmm. and we're pushing quite dramatically to, to have our applications, you know, and ideally one app, right? You know, using HTML5 responsive web design, have that app, you know, be able to support small form factor, you know, tablet, desktop, even big screen. We are also going towards that path as well with all of our apps being on desktop and then slowly shifting over to mobile, that they have to be mobile because that's the customer's expectation. Mm -hmm. And so they want to take exactly what they have on desktop and move it to a mobile platform. What we're trying to um, educate and push the company towards going is uh, with mobile first. So thinking about uh, uh, creating a, an application that is specifically designed to be used on a mobile device as opposed to on the desktop and on mobile as well. Mm -hmm. But of course we're also looking at having all of our um, desktop apps ported over, um, at least displayed properly on a mobile device through um, HTML5 and good responsive design. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're just tackling right now. Alex, does this follow larger trends in, overall in the enterprise, do you think, or is it specific to, to these types of companies? Cross-platform for sure, definitely a trend. And one of the things we're starting to see is um, creating apps with a wrapper around them, and so they can be updated quickly, or the server there can be better, easier server calls, right? So Ganesh, what is Intel doing tool-wise to help people who do need to create native experiences on mobile? So something that has to access the camera or the accelerometer or that sort of thing. I'm working on a tool called the Intel XDK for cross-platform development kit. HTML5 um, offers uh, a lot of uh, good facilities, but at the same time, like you call out, you want to be able to um, have a call into the native layer so you get uh, native type performance. So um, within the tool, we support Cardova, which is um, a fairly popular API, right, to be able to call into native. We also have our own native API. So the idea is to provide the flexibility to the developer who is having this challenge of um, creating apps creating apps, whether it's customer facing or internal, but at the same time have native-like functionality, um, be able to work across Android and iOS and on the desktop. Our goal is to have the widest reach in terms of being able to target um, all these applications, uh, but make it easy for developers. That's so awesome. We need, we need that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> so we touched on APIs a little bit. I kind of want to loop back to that a second and pose a question to Bill. Underlying all, all of this sort of uh, app conversation, I think probably in people's minds they're visualizing mm -hmm. a user interface and maybe it's on a phone and maybe it's on a tablet, maybe it's on a desktop. But um, I think the trend is clearly that they're lots of different clients. You know, you can't rebuild an entire stack from front to back to mm -hmm. have a mobile version of a website, for example. Mm -hmm. Though I feel like APIs are the answer to that. Our enterprise app strategy is, you know, um, really move the back end to the cloud, 
Right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of um, good, you know, uh, velocity reasons, financial reasons, good things for IT to move the back end to the cloud. Move the front end across multiple platforms, multi-desktop and mobile, and connect them through services, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, clients across multiple platforms, back ends to the cloud. Um, how can we um, abstract that and create, you know, a standard service that multiple front end clients could consume such that I don't have to replace the complete legacy application. So have you found, like, management of the APIs to be a problem. We have users across the globe that may be in various countries and those countries have different regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. um, in a secure way, in a way that we can trust the information is going to be used for the purposes it's intended to use. Using uh, things like you know Intel Expressway for service integration, um, understanding how the applications consume those. Um, you know, Certainly service integration is a core part of our strategy. Mm -hmm. Where do you guys think App development is going to go in the next few years. So, mm -hmm. Marie, do you want to jump in on that one? Right now, the hot topic is definitely wearable technology. Mm -hmm. We're looking at that, and Nest, with its its intelligent um, thermometer, is is uh, starting to make people talk about connected homes a little bit more than, than the way it was before. And we're looking at Thomson Reuters as more innovative uh, mobile areas and where the future is going. We're looking at definitely providing news, um, financial and just general news into homes. It could be on a, a mirror, on, a, on your fridge, on um, your table in the kitchen. Essentially anything can be programmable. Any sensor can be a programmable and be, can be connected via an API. And mm -hmm. I think that is really the, the crux of the Internet of Things, is being able to connect any object. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a total rethinking of the way that data, the role that data has in our life, you know. Mm -hmm. So this table's on a table; it's really a data object. It's a user and, interface, you know. Yeah. And yeah. so mm -hmm. that that changes application development entirely. Mm -hmm. I, I think the certainly connectivity across different form factors that we haven't traditionally done work on, mm -hmm. um, but also the notion um, that is just starting to emerge even more which is using multiple devices at the same time, right? It used to be, you know, get you windows of an of a application into perhaps, you know, my, you know, Ultrabook or my desktop or my phone, but now using both screens, right? One that may give me some information mm -hmm. as I go up and present, at, you know, versus one that's presenting elsewhere. So you're using actually more than one device, right? And as they get smaller, you'll see, you know, an application for app developers you're starting to see, you know, through APIs and transactions, these connected devices doing the same business function, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, adding companion apps, right? So connectivity API is super important, cross device is super important, and for app developers, rethinking parallel logic to a, another level, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, without sacrifice, sacrificing security and Without sacrificing and, security, yeah. that's right. So you have increasing data, more people viewing this data. But what excites me about the future is, and, and, and this is where HTML5 is going to shine, is converting this data into information, more interesting things, interesting ways of uh, looking at this data, interesting interactions that you can create with people um, with this data. And, and I believe that HTML5 with, um, with, with the level of usage that it's currently having and, and the ease with which you can potentially get started I believe um, will lead to very exciting ways in which we look at data in the future in ways we haven't really thought about today. Awesome. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks to each of our guests, and thank you for joining us on Inside the Brackets. And be sure to join us in the coming months as we explore topics like HTML5 performance, security, and how to monetize your apps. See you next time. Thank you.